Okay, welcome back. We are now reading the language of the goddess, chapter six, the eyes of the goddess. The opening image for this chapter is of a, a vinca lid. This is a lid to a vessel. So in the vinca culture, they created these really elaborate lids for their vessels. And again, it's important to point out that the vessel would have contained food and that the vessel itself, as evidenced by this lid, is an anthropomorphic representation of the goddess who is the bearer of life that is food. Um, so the, let's see if this is looking right. Oh, you can see me well. Okay. Let me adjust that a little bit. All right. Um, so this is a vessel lid from the earliest Vinca supernatural character of the eyes made clear with enormous surrounding triangles. So again, big triangles. Hey, look, there's some chevrons. This is clearly the goddess. All right the eyes of the goddess. So let's start with this image here. This is one of the most striking images in the entire book, in my opinion. Um, figure 86, upper paleolithic figurine modeled from paste of clay and ground bone, while slit eyes from which streams flow down over breasts. What's remarkable about this image is that it is from 24,000 BC. So look at that. It's made of clay and bone. And there's this strong symbolic association so with liquid, right? So these are tears. Tears running down from the eyes. Liquid from the eyes is associated with liquid from the breasts. So the goddess is a watery, watery character whose breasts are linked with her eyes. Both of these fluids are life-giving waters. And so this idea of the divine feminine giving birth through the waters of life was present 24,000 BC. Section 6.1 as a source of divine liquids. The large eyes with which the goddess is portrayed strongly suggest the epithet all-seeing for her. However, the symbolism which surrounds the eyes speaks for an even more fundamental attribute, namely that the eyes, like the goddess's breasts or mouth, are a divine source. The concept of the eyes as source must have existed in the Upper Paleolithic on the figurine from Dolni Vestonice, a stream flowing down the body of the deity begins at the eyes. Figure 86. The idea of divine moisture from the eyes is present in the markings on artifact of the Mesolithic and pre-pottery Neolithic period. The incised concentric semicircles on pe pebbles from the Natufan culture of the 10th millennium BC perhaps carry the same idea. So the Natufan culture is present in modern day Palestine, um, pebble effigies found in the Jordan Valley, and this area of the world is where we have the earliest evidence for grain agriculture. Um, I read a paper recently which said that they had evidence which might even date grain agriculture back to 15,000 BC, which is significantly older than what most what most uh, sources place it. So it seems likely that in, in a few decades we're going to find evidence for agriculture that is older, much older than we originally anticipated. And one of the oldest centers of agriculture is this Natufin culture in Palestine and Jordan. Um, so there are these pebbles. This theme of divine moisture flowing from the eyes continues into the Mesolithic and Neolithic as these incised pebbles, pebble effigies of pottery in the Neolithic arrest attest. So these were found in Lebanon. And, you know, I mean, this is, this is, uh, it's quite a stretch to say that these pebbles are the goddess, but I think that if if our modern penchant for, for huge, cute animals that are, whose bodies are 90% head indicates, I think, that we have a tendency to view the world like this for a very long time. So it's not difficult for me to imagine that the creator of these pebbles, somebody took a pebble and marked it, marked it very deliberately, it seems likely that their markings would have had at least as one of the meanings that they were making a face. And, you know, what that means in a greater context is difficult to say, but the fact that people were doing this in the earliest agricultural society indicates that this, this marking and this kind of symbolism is probably deeply linked with agriculture. 
Um, okay. So, um, they speak for a continuity of the idea into the Neolithic. The eyes are the bird goddesses. Her identity is clear when eyes are shown joined with bees and chevrons. During the Copper Age and later, as we shall see from the description of Vinca Lids that follows, the eyes are quite regularly encircled or accompanied by parallel lines, rain streams, meanders, nets, and other symbols of the aquatic family. All right, now we're into Vinca Lids. So the Vinca culture in northern Greece and southeastern Europe um, made these vessels, and the lids have the shape of a goddess head. So you can see this vessel, there's a meander, and there's this anthropomorphic lid. Um, so what does figure 88 say? The Vinca people produced a unique ceramic lidded jar with owl eyes. This motif catalog of the lids, decorations, is an assemblage of bird goddess symbolism, B, X, meander, parallel lines, zigzag, streams, etc., all associated with enormous and compelling eyes. Indeed. Okay. These richly decorated lidded jars, jars with owl eyes are a ceramic form uniquely characteristic of the Vinca people. The marks on the lids derive from the symbol system connoting the bird goddess. The meander, bands of parallel lines, the dotted meander, single or multiple Vs, rows of striated triangles, groups of two or three diagonal lines, framed columns of banded Vs. All of this is on this image. The presence of just these symbols would seem to designate the vessels as exclusively the property of the goddess consecrated to use in her rites. So here we have another uh, metaphysical alphabet, if you will. So these are a series of patterns that were found on the lids of Vinca jars. V, chevron, X with chevron, X with double chevron, meander, chevron with dots, parallel lines, wavy lines, symbols for water, and these geometric motifs. So what is... Um, here. So this is two. This motif catalog of lid decorations is a semblance of bird goddess symbolism. So she's pulled all of these symbols off of the lids. And they're they're pretty they're pretty profound. Um, and we've spent the last three chapters, last five chapters rather, uh, going over this this symbolism and, and learning what it means. Okay. In the past, Vinca lids have been interpreted as stylized representations of the head of a bear or a cat. This they certainly are not. The fact that there were no cats in Neolithic and Copper Age Europe. In fact, there were. The fact is that there were no cats in Neolithic or Copper Age Europe. Since they have a beak but no mouth, the eyes are often the ear tufts of an owl. The eyes and often the ear tufts of an owl. The symbolic markings indicative of the bird goddess, they are most probably what they seem, images of that deity. So, you know, Gimbutas does this thing, probably the weakest part of this book is like she'll she'll claim that birds are places where it's not necessarily obvious that this is a bird. I could you could make strong arguments that these do not resemble bird goddesses necessarily. Um and so, so Gimbutas will, will often stretch her symbolism a little further than maybe she should, but I think this is forgivable. You know, I think that the, the, core, the core points that she's making are, are held up very, very strongly. And if there are exaggerations in interpretation, you know, that I think that's counterbalanced by the fact that there must be much deeper interpretations to all of these things than we could possibly know because they were embedded in a in a ritual context which does not fossilize. Um, so I I think we can forgive some of the some of the bigger leaps that she makes because we know that that meaning is there even if she's inventing her own new meaning we know that these things are sophisticated enough to have those kinds of meanings. Um, yeah. So here's figure 89. Some examples of the exquisite Vinca lids. One double line surround and emphasize the eyes. Rainbow incised bands flow over the forehead. Earliest Vinca, this is 5200 BC. Two, the eyes supernatural characteristics are made clear with these enormous surrounding triangles. Note the double V's on the forehead. This is also early Vinca. Three, arch streams. 
multiple chevron stretch over the forehead and down the sides of the face. So here are the arch streams, here's the multiple chevrons. Bands of dotted meanders cover the top and back. So these are the dotted meanders. You can't see the back, but those are meanders there. Mid Vinca, 5000 to 4500 BC. Four streams flow around and down the eyes and beside the beak. Bands of horizontal striations cover the area below the eyes, streams, and V's. Here's the meanders, here's the streams, here's the V's. And meanders mark the forehead, mid Vinca, 5000 to 4500 BC. Five, here we have trilines, one, two, three. Trilines arch over the eyes and brush lines sweep back over the forehead. These are the brushes, also wing shapes. A panel of perpendicular diagonals fills the mask's lower half. These are the perpendicular diagonals. Mid Vinca, 5000 to 4500 BC, and here's six. Streams flow around the eyes. The forehead is covered with a meander from the back of the head with a chevron. So here's the, the forehead covered with a meander. And they're all uh, between 10 and 20 centimeters in size, usually under 15. Okay. Motifs on the lid have been characterized as follows. Chevron, multiple or single, combining with crossbands, amplified or soaring, and combined with meanders. Two, meander alone or combined with chevrons. Three, streams, diagonal and vertical lines of parallel, bands of parallel lines, zigzags, striated or dots. Four, streams beneath the eyes in panels. The enormous eyes with their expression of supernatural perspicacity are a major design element. Bands of parallel lines or vertical striations above, below, or encircling the eyes constitute a metaphor for divine tears. The eyes of the goddess are the source of life-sustaining water. On to the next. The masks on elaborate Vinca figurines also feature enormous semicircular eyes. So these are masks on figurines here modeled in relief and incised and white encrusted. The treatment of the eyes is very similar to that of the lids and it's an aggregation of symbols that accompanies them. So triangular eyes, here's a meander. The beaked mass of a figure with triangular eyes and surrounding groups by parallel lines meanders cover the forehead. Figure 90. Okay, so that was in the Vinca culture. So the Vinca were in Greece and Yugoslavia area, southeastern Europe around 5,000 BC, 7,000 years ago. Now, in section 6-3, we're going to move to the eye goddess of Western Europe. So Western Europe developed agriculture about 2,000 years later than Eastern Europe did. Um, and, and so the dates are going to be shifted, and they definitely have a distinct style as well, but you can see the commonalities. Um, so... The term eye goddess came into use after the publications in 1957 of the eye goddess by OGS Crawford. The goddess of the title was said to have originated in the Near East, her cult then diffusing across the Mediterranean to Western Europe. Indeed, the resemblances of the figurines from of Temple Brac, Eastern Syria, 3500 BC, with their staring eyes and brows joined over the beak to the stone idols of Spain and Portugal with oculi motif is quite astonishing. The similarity, however, most probably resulted from universally held symbolic concept of divine eyes, from which the Western variants developed. So here's this, this is a classical evolutionary phylogenetic question, right? So you see, you see that there are eye patterns in Western Europe, and you see that there are eye patterns in Eastern Europe. And there's two, two uh, hypotheses for why that could be the case. One hypothesis is that it's vertical descent, right? That the, the eye patterns in Western Europe are direct descendants of the eye patterns in Eastern Europe. That's a possibility, empirically testable. And then there's another possibility of convergent evolution or, or, or common ancestry. So it's not necessarily that the Western European eyes are descendants of the Eastern European eyes, but rather that they are both descendants of a common ancestor in prehistory. I mean, this is, this is still prehistory, but pre-prehistory. So, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago. And Gimbutas is saying that that second possibility, that they both descended from common stock and that 
in in some sense it's convergent evolution or or you know elaboration on a common theme in different ways is more likely than than this motif diffusing after it had been articulated in in a particular form in the vinca um so that's maybe maybe that's uh, a little bit uh too getting lost in the weeds but i think it's really important that when we're analyzing this symbolism that we can keep phylogenetic questions in mind because those phylogenetic questions will keep us rooted in the evidence of what we're talking about because it's very easy to sort of take these symbols and just run with them and interpret so 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 much on them and by keeping these phylogenetic questions firmly in our mind we can determine what these symbols mean but also also have have some sort of rooting in empirical evidence and i think that's very important as we're trying to, to articulate a, a a modern metaphysics um a modern cosmology so here are these western european owl eyes western european eye goddess is known from the sepulchral artifacts so these are death artifacts they're bur they're burial artifacts um you know they're pieces of art that were that were buried with people when they died West European eye goddess is known from the sepulchral artifacts and settlements. The eyes on these bone flanges are surrounded by multiple eyebrows, triangles, hourglass shapes, and nets. Almeria, Almeria los Milares culture in Spain. The West European eye goddess of France, Spain, Portugal, and Great Britain is manifested in the stelae, figurines, and amulets of megalithic cultures dating from the 5th to the 3rd century, the 5th to the 3rd millennium BC. Um, unquestionably, the eyes of the goddess are a dominant feature on some of these monuments, justifying Crawford's appellation. But the powerful indication that the eye goddess is related to Southeast European bird goddess is not a completely different divinity. Um, but the powerful indication that the eye goddess is related to the Southeast European bird goddess and is not a completely different divinity of indigenous origin is the symbolic markings on the monuments, chevrons, zigzags, and powerful lines. This is virtually the same assemblage found on the Southeast European figurines, masks, and lids. The sole distinction of the West European goddess is her characteristically owlish appearance. Um, so again, Gimbutas is saying that this owl this version of the owl goddess and the Vinca version of the owl goddess are descended from a common stock thousands of years before. Um, the round eyes so definitive, so here's an image of an owl. The round of eyes so definitively established her identity that often no auxiliary anthropomorphic features were deemed necessary. So the West European eye goddess is known almost exclusively from sepulchral artifacts, either as large stone stelae standing in the centers of megalithic tombs, or as figurine, bone flange, stone cylinder, or schist plaque deposited within. We shall return to the necrotic personality of the eye goddess when we talk of her association with tombs and caves, see section 18. Here we are interested only in the design context of the eye motif. Flange amulets from megalithic tombs in Spain and Portugal are incised with round eyes in the center or upper half of the bone, with additional designs above and below the eyes on the back. The brows join around the eyes. Join, uh, the, sorry, the brows join to form a beak, the outer ends continuing around the eyes. So here's an image of an owl. Figure 92. The similarity between the round eyes of an owl and the Neolithic bone symbol of death is astonishing. The owl has extraordinary visual powers. No wonder its eyes became divine, a symbol of regeneration akin to the life-giving water, sun, and snake coil. A simple bone, the polished epiphysis of young animal, is used to represent the death aspect of the goddess. This is this, this image here. Her numinous round eyes are of shell carefully inlaid and glued to the ends of bone. Look at that. Yeah, they really remind me of cartoon characters. Let's look at the whole image in one. Wow. So there's an owl bone. Okay. The central motif is often surrounded by many parallel lines. On some amulets, the multiple eyebrow motif alternates with bags of bands of zigzags or nets. 
The eyes of stone cylinder figurines are flanked by double or triple chevrons and underlined by semicircular lines. The zigzag design at the back of the head and over the crown is apparently a hair water metaphor. The third type of amulet, schist plaques perforated for suspension, has an indication of arms along the sides. The typical owl eyes and beaks, horizontal trilines, chevron zigzags, and striated triangle designs cover the rest of the plaque on both sides. See figure 371. This is annoying, right? I want to see figure 371 now, but it's like, you know, 400 pages away, so I'm not going to show you figure 371. I apologize. Um, but I will show you figure 93. Here's figure 93. Um, wow. These stone eye idols from megalithic graves all share two or four lines. Here's two lines, here's four lines. Uh, two or four lines curving under the eyes and ending as chevrons on the temples. The zigzag pattern over the top and back may represent hair and the black columns apart. Los Milares. Mos Milares. I'm gonna exit this program that has changed the color of the screen. These stone idols from megalithic graves all share two or four lines curving under the eyes and ending as chevrons on the temples. The zigzag pattern over the top and back may represent hair and the black columns apart. Okay, now look at that. So these are on, on stone cylinders huge eyes. Wow. So these are from Spain. Wow. What's their date? Early third millennium, so 5,000 years ago. The eye motif is also part of the design on bowls, dishes, and megaliths recovered from the Los Milares and other Tholos tombs in Almeria. The so-called radiating sun motif is a compound eye sun symbol, is more logically seen as a radiant divine eye. The first example is composed of eyes and vulva, an abstract rendering of the goddess, figure 94. Here's figure 94, so here's eyes and then vulva. Um, radiant divine eyes appear on the Tholos tomb artifacts that may be related to spring-summer growth rites. One is an abstract rendering of the goddess, eyes underlined by a curving triline. One, two, three, one, two, three, and this, of course, is a triangle with three sides, and then the eyes. Two, divine eyes with brush eyebrows and columns of curved lines, three horizontal bands of parallel lines, and three vertical dotted bands separating them from the stag and two deer. Get out of here, dog. Dog is bothering me. Alright, divine eyes with brush eyebrows and columns of curved lines. Now we're on to figure two. Divine eyes with brush eyebrows and columns of curved lines, three horizontal bands of parallel lines, and three vertical dotted bands separating them from a stag and two deer. So here's eyes on the front, stag and the deer. And so again, by indexical association, we associate the eyes of the goddess with deer, one of her animals, and then all this water imagery. Also from Spain. Um, and now three, these radiant divine eyes engraved on Irish stones are almost identical to those found on Spanish ceramics. Wow. Yeah, so you've got these radiant sun eyes. So all throughout Western Europe you see this motif. Um, one and two A. Irish Neolithic. Four, another example of the magical affinity between owl eyes and water of life. Um, cut marks from the small Cess Kilgreen megalithic tombstone at the inner end of a chamber. Um, that's four. This compound symbol is illuminated by the sun on the summer solstice. And five, here we are. In Neolithic Denmark, radiant eyes flanked with chevrons. Look at those radiant eyes, look at the suns, and then there's the chevrons over there. In Neolithic Denmark, radiant eyes flanked with chevrons appear on vases in the funnel-necked beaker culture. On this jar, design is incised. On this jar, the design is incised and stabbed, but the eyebrows and beak of the owl goddess are in relief. So, these patterns were stabbed in, but the beak and eye lines were actually added with clay. Um, 
added, or sorry, but the insides instead, but the eyebrows and beak of the owl goddess are in relief. So that's 5,000 year old artifact. Now, let's look at all those at once. So these are various eyes. Wow. Okay, where were we? Sorry, trying to find my place. This book is difficult to navigate. Um, the eye motif is also part of the design on bowls, dishes, and megaliths recovered from Los Milares and other Tholos tombs in Almeria. Their so-called radiating sun motif, there's this radiating sun motif, is a compound eye sun symbol. It is more logically seen as a radiant divine eye. The first example is composed of eyes and vulva. We were looking at that before, um, figure 94. The first example is composed of eyes and vulva. Um, that was this one, this one. First example of eyes and vulva. Um, and abstract rendering of the goddess. Often the eyes are associated with a single or multiple eyebrow motif and with multiple parallel lines and chevron. On one richly decorated bull, two units of, of the oculi motif and one unit of the stag, which does are separated by panels of curved lines, horizontal striated bands, and three vertical dotted columns. Right, so that's this one. Here's the eyes, here's the stag. Um, this compound symbolism is very likely associated with seasonal spring or summer rites. Antlers mysteriously appear in April and grow quickly through May and June. In July, the tines are fully grown. They are an unmistakable metaphor for plant growth, in which seeds are sown in the spring and maturity in the summer is reached in the summer. The associated multiple lines and garlands may be connected with spring rains, or they may represent a calendrical notation. Note the 12 horizontal lines. So that goes back to um, Marshak's theory that a lot of these artifacts were used for timekeeping. So she's saying that there are 12 lines associated with the, uh, the is that true? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Yeah, see that's crazy. So, so the number 12 associated with the number of moons in the year or something like that. So it, it seems, and, and, and there are these lines here. So this, this would be a really strong candidate for some sort of timekeeping time keeping interpretation. But of course, knowing exactly how they were using these things to keep time is difficult to say. Um, the done by panels and curved lines, horizontal striated bands, and three vertical dotted columns. This compound symbolism is very likely associated, oh, we did that. Um, the associated multiple lines and garland may be connected with spring rains, or they may represent a calendrical notation. Note the 12 horizontal lines. Suns and radiant divine eyes are also encountered on megaliths in the tomb shrines in Ireland, usually associated with dot in circles, concentric circles, and brushes, figure 94.3. So that's these ones. So these ones are in Ireland, these eyes, suns, spirals thing. Um, okay. Um, a magical affinity of owl eyes with a cut mark and cut mark in concentric circle, the symbols of the center and source is represented on an engraving stone from Sess Kilogreen megalithic tomb, figure 94.4. So that's, come on, that's this one. It's found in a tomb. Oh, that's so beautiful. Like, can you imagine, like, if this, this were the only kind of vessel you ever ate out of, like, you know, none of, none of your, your fine, bland china, right, or plastic cutlery, like, everything you ate of, out of, would have been an embodiment of the goddess. I mean, that's, it's a really powerful world to live in, that every vessel that you ever consumed food out of reminded you of the, of the all-consuming powers of, of life-giving fertility. It's a lot. Um... 
The act of fusion of the two symbols, eyes and cup marks, itself was a ritual ensuring life forces. The stone is illuminated by the sun and summer solstice. Across the North Sea, the radiant eyes of the Allegatus appear on funerary vases of the funnel-necked beaker culture. Okay. Great. Um, so we just read a summary of all of these. Now we're going to move on to section 6.4, as snake coils, ram horns, horns, and the eyes of the sun. The pictorial association of eyes with snakes and the representation of eyes by snake coils was a widespread phenomenon in both southeastern and western Europe. So these are, she's claiming that these are snakes and that these are also ram horns. The fusion of these two disparate elements into a single symbolic expression held for old European artists a special fascination to which they responded with particular ability. The dynamism of the serpent is a very ancient and recurring human occupation. The snake's energy, it was believed, was drawn from water and the sun, right? So here she's claiming that this is a snake and it's associated with both water and sun. That's what we were showing before. Um, and so with a lot of these artifacts, like if you look at this here, she's claiming that these are snakes too. And like, that's not immediately apparent. Uh, but there are some artifacts where those coils have faces on them, have heads and eyes, and they're clearly snakes. And, and so we're dealing with a symbolic system of sometimes the iconism of, like, snake. This isn't terribly snake iconic. Um, it's much, like, if, if you're going to say that it's a snake, it's purely a symbolic snake, because, I mean, it's, like, slightly iconic, but in any case... Gimbutas might be making a stretch with these, but the more artifacts that she shows you, the more the claims that this is actually a snake seem to make sense. Um, so she's, she's saying that snake imagery held, held a, a particular meaning in, in the ancient world that was almost diametrically opposed to the Abrahamic meaning that we see, right? So the dynamism of the serpent is a very ancient and recurring human preoccupation. The snake's energy, it was believed, was drawn from the water and the sun. The archaic metaphor that pairs the magical power of the serpent with the creative force in nature must have crystallized very early from a natural intuition. This imaginative metaphor is thoroughly integrated in the art of old Europe. Snake coils as divine eyes appear singly or joined, and a design motif on ceramics, temples, and tombs. So, unlike the Abrahamic tradition in which the snake is considered a corrupter, in this tradition, the snake is a source of fertility um, and potentially also destruction, right? You have this Ouroboros image where it's creation and destruction at once, but it's not the same thing as corruption and the source of sin, necessarily. Um, so you see that a lot of the symbols in the Old Testament come from this earlier tradition, but they've been inverted. The magical affinity of snake and eye is pictorially expressed on Cucutini vases as early as the 4th millennium BC by their juxtaposition of painted bands by a double spiral with broad undulate snake band below it, right? So here, this is eyes, snakes. Um, the motif is continued in the Aegean area throughout the 3rd millennium BC. A particularly interesting example is preserved on a shard dating from the first half of the 3rd millennium uh, BC from Attica, right? This is this figure. The graphic metaphor of eyes and mouth as snake coils, snake coils, and that of the brows of the ram. So these are ram brows. Again, like, is this really a ram? Well, with this, not necessarily, but when you read the ram chapter, it becomes clear that the ram has become abstracted into all of these different forms. So it's a ram, it's a chevron, it's eyebrows. To the graphic metaphor of eyes and mouth as snake coils has added that of the brows of ram's horns, a symbol of fecund energy of the ram, sacred animal of the goddess, see section 9 below. So let's read about these artifacts now. The dynamic energy of the snake is often coupled with the divine eye source in southeast and west Europe. On this Kukuteni lid, the eyes are snake spirals bordered with snake-like bands, negative design. So this is a 6,000-year-old artifact from the Kukuteni period in Romania. Um, and then here, this comes off of a, uh, of a jar. Um, this is figure two. On the base and necks of the Cucutini bee culture, large eyes appeared interspersed with two snakes and crescents, right? So these are eyes, snakes, crescents here. The ram, the sacred animal of the goddess, is also associated with snakes and eyes. On this pot shard from the early third millennium, the eyes are snake coils and the eyebrows are ram horns. So we have ram horns here. And eyes, and here's ram horns here, and eyes. 
The eyebrows are in relief while the eyes are excised and white encrusted. All right, on to the next page. So now we're on to megalithic tombs. Um, the oculi motifs as snake coils of ram horns engraved on the entrances to tombs as on these rock cut tombs in Sicily, early Bronze Age. Wow, look at that. That's so beautiful. So here we have eyes slash ram's horns slash serpents. You know, they're iconic of all three of those. Here's the chevron. Here you have a, a vague hip shape. Chevron for the pubic triangle. Chevron for the beak. Wow. All right, let's read about these now. The oculi, coil, ram horn metaphors engraved on the entrance doors of early Bronze Age rock cut tombs of southeastern Sicily. Magnificent snake coil oculi are abundant in the early great stone temples of Malta, at Gigantia, Hagar, Quim, Bugiba, and Tarxeran. So there's these amazing, amazing temples at Malta, and you should probably just pause this video and Google temples at Malta to see some of these images. But if you're not going to do that, I'm going to show you figure 97. So here, these are these eye images carved at Malta. Um, figure 97, the dynamic snake and divine eye source combined in these snake oculi carved in relief on blocks from magnificent temples in Malta and Ireland. So one and two, these two are from Malta. And then three, uh, this one here, this one is from Ireland. Wow. Um, so those are, those are impressive. Let's go back. Um, the V sign be between the snake coil eyes may represent a beak or it may simply serve as a designation of the goddess, right? So here the V sign may be a beak or it might just be a symbol of the goddess more abstractly. And the most elaborately decorated block still extant can be seen in the temple of Tarxen, third millennium BC. It's large slab motif developed as a decorative device um, among them long blocks with running spiral motifs, sprouting buds and branches. Collectively, the temples are witness to the outstanding talent and craftsmanship devoted to at Malta to the worship of the goddess. The megalithic art of Western Europe is replete with snake coil and double snake coil motifs as independent units or as part of an anthropomorphic figure. In some cases, the double snake coil eye and the single snake coil motif occur together or on a single stone surface. Linguistic evidence also reflects the peculiar interchangeability of eyes and the sun. The Old Irish suil is I, while in other languages it means sun. For example, Lithuanian and Latvian saule means sun. Furthermore, there was a goddess named Sulis, quite likely the, the same noun as suil, equated with Minerva in Roman Britain. She was the patroness of art and healing at Thermothring Springs in Bath, Aqua Silis. Her epithet was suelvii, in plural form, twin sunned. A semantic transfer eye to sun in this divine epithet is quite clear. The magic regenerating eyes of this goddess were seen as suns. So this is wild, right? So like, I think the strongest pieces of evidence that she brings in are these anecdotes from more recent times, talking about linguistic evidence where the meaning is a little bit easier for us to interpret, right? So earlier, like over here, she was saying like, hey, look, these eyes are suns. And you're like, okay, yeah, I can see that. But like, were they really suns? Like, was that really the intention of the people drawing this, that I'm drawing both eyes and suns? Like, maybe this person was drawing flower shapes on the rock. Who knows? But then we have this piece of linguistic evidence, and it's like, well, no. Like, the word for eye and the word for sun in these old languages, like Old Irish and Latvian, is the same word. And, and here we have twin sunned, right? Twin sunned, I mean, that's quite, quite an image for a pair of eyes. So by, by using these modern anecdotes where, where the language has a translation that we feel more firm about, we can go backwards in history and interpret these artifacts that we wouldn't firmly be able to interpret otherwise. So that's really cool. Um, so here are these eye suns in Malta. Okay, so now the last section is about cut marks. So let's look at this image here, cut marks, and what's the, the, um, 
Like divine eyes, cut marks symbolizing the source of life, giving moisture in the British Neolithic. Okay. So, this is a statue from the British Neolithic as cut marks and wells. Predominant features of deliberately modified large rocks and human-shaped stones throughout Europe, particularly in the west and north, are small round hollows, the so-called cut marks. They appear by the hundreds alone or in association with eyes and snakes. Occasionally an anthropomorphic stone, the goddess is solidly covered with them. Not infrequently they are surrounded by single, double, or multiple circles and are clearly metaphor, i.e. eyes, that are simultaneously the source of divine liquid, the water of life itself, and its receptacles when it falls. Their meaning is suggested by the fact that such cut marks have, to this day, retained some of their symbolic significance in the European peasant subculture, which attributes healing powers to the rainwater which collects in them. Paralytics and those with other disabilities seek relief by drinking the holy water, washing in it, or rubbing in it on the afflicted parts. In Greece, the July 26th feast of St. Parasekevi, which means Friday, the heir of the prehistoric goddess is an especially good time for curing eye diseases. Hundreds of silver ex votos representing human eyes can be seen adorning her icons. In the summer of 1986, I saw such votive offerings attached to the paintings of the saint in the chapels on the island of Paros in the middle of the Aegean Sea. Right, so again, some of the most powerful uh, pieces of evidence that she has to marshal are modern pieces that hark back to this earlier time. So she's talking about this, this, this cup ritual um, that is supposed to be good for eye disease and like these, these sort of like really, really idiosyncratic ritual. You'd be like, what does that mean? And you'd be like, oh, that's a vestigial thing from, from a, a much more robust religion 8,000 years ago. It's pretty remarkable. A cut mark is a miniature well. Holy wells under large stones are sacrosanct and considered to be mysterious sources of the goddess's life-giving moisture, a belief found in all Europe up to the 20th century. In prehistory and in folk memories, well and cup mark were symbolically interchangeable. Both were symbols of centrally concentrated goddess life force. And with that, we have finished chapter six. Thank you for joining me on this journey, and I will see you next time.